So I think the critical question is to ask what the structure of the drug is in terms of its similarity to neurotransmitters, where in the brain it localizes, that is where it concentrates. And the third feature is effectively what are the dosages. Now, in terms of uh, psychotropic drugs, I think it's important to realize that if we look at this great rabble knot, which is the human brain, and here we have a nice shot of it, we can see there's the frontal lobe, and of course, if you influence the frontal lobe just a bit, you can get creativity. One of the, people, one of the reasons that people report creativity with marijuana is that this mild anxiolytic effect produces this kind of free association. But remember, all drugs influence maximally at small dosages, these kinds of drugs, and too much of a dosage can actually be uh, an opposite effect or produce an opposite effect. The temporal lobe is also involved. Uh, we look at the temporal lobe here. The temporal lobe is actually the locus for LSD effects. Most people don't know that. But if you remove the temporal lobe, there are no LSD effects. That in many respects, LSD experiences and most of the serotonin-based uh, psychedelics work by producing a dreamlike state and involving the temporal lobe. And experiments have been shown that if you remove the temporal lobe, LSD just doesn't produce the experiences that occur in the normal person. So we have to know something about this great rabble knot, and I think the first thing we must know is that if we take a look at that brain, there it is, the white matter, sending information in and out of the gray area, which is the cortices, that for all practical purposes, consciousness is a closed loop. We have all this information going up into the cortex, but really, if we think at it quantitatively, only about 20% of the input to our, cor our cortex is sensory. All the rest of it is talk or interactions between those neurons, which means that consciousness is a closed loop, and sensory input is just a minor, minor modification. Consciousness is actually created by this loop that is activated once every approximately 20 milliseconds with a phase modulation of about 12 milliseconds. That means if we change the neurochemistry within the cortices, we change the way you experience the world, we change your consciousness. So let's begin then with uh, some of these classic ones in terms of understanding <clears throat> the kinds of images. Let's take a look at the consistent images associated with, uh, here we go, mescaline, for example. Now, mescaline is actually a trimethoxy uh, ethyl amide, which means it's basically a compound very similar to dopamine. Remember what dopamine is. That's the one involved with all kinds of addictions. And there's a range of addictive capacities. Uh, marijuana is not very addictive. LSD a bit more. And still some other drugs like opiates quite addictive. But only about 20% become addicted. So the point is that all of these various kinds of psychotropics, when you take them, go through various kinds of stages. Mescaline, so-called peyote, in stage one, the typical experience is a grating or a lattice cobweb shapes, a tunnel or a funnel or a cone, and a spiral. Of course, many conditions can produce this. Psychotropics can do it. In stage two, in stage two, we have meaningful images, very meaningful images emerge. And these meaningful images can be very idiosyncratic. Then you have peoples, animals, and places. 60% to 70% of all people or all subjects report small animals or human figures that are friendly or caricature-like. Now, in some cultures, it may be called the totem, the spirit guide, the protectorate. And, of course, 70%, 72% report religious imagery. And that doesn't change that much with most of your famous psychotropic compounds. Now, I'm going to mention later that you don't have to have a chemical do this. The appropriately patterned magnetic field applied to the brain can also do this as well. In other words, you do not have to have a drug. Anything that changes brain activity, including these patterned fields we've been developing, can produce similar experiences. Well, let me give you some actual drawings. This is a drawing of a woman who was having a near-death experience. Now, very often, near-death experiences are coupled with these psychotropic effects because hypoxia 
alterations in cortical activity can actually produce something very similar. Here's a woman who was having a near-death experience. She suddenly felt all of these little things around her coming out of an iconic, in this case it was uh, Mary and Child. This is a Japanese woman. Because remember, the human brain is remarkably similar across all six billion of us. We exaggerate the differences, but neurochemically, we're almost identical. So consequently, all of us will be prone to these kinds of experiences. We will go through the same stages because we are a singular species. We just exaggerate the differences. The actual picture looks like this. This is what she drew, what she would saw, these little entities. Then she saw this. And then, of course, classic. You've seen this in most all cultures. A kind of window opens. It's sort of like the light at the other end. And, of course, you've all heard the very idea of the light at the end of the tunnel. Then she perceived this particular shape full of multiple colors. Then, of course, because of the nature of the uh, activity, she felt herself moving through this, through this uh, funnel or tunnel. She felt the moving sensations. Because notice the faces are emerging. And, and the, of course, luckily, she was an artist who could report this. And as she got closer to the bottom, of course, she began to have this feeling of reaching infinity. Notice these are all faces. Of course, all cultures talk about this. If you look at the Egyptian Book of the Dead or the Tibetan Book of the Dead or any of these other representations of what it's like to be in an altered state, you will find that very similar patterns emerge. Remember, six billion brains were basically the same, well, were the copies, six billion copies of the same DNA, really. Now, one of the typical ways by which this is done is some of the drugs, for example, that involve serotonin. And some of the classic ones involved with serotonin include psilocybin, and it produces very specific kinds of patterns that you see the Aztecs used to uh, imitate on their various designs, these intricate designs. And of course, lysergic acid amide, morning glory seeds. Uh, morning glory seeds, uh, and of course, LSD is one of the derivatives of that. Actually, it came from ergot. The one we're talking about as well is harmine, uh, which is the Banisteriopsis in the Western Orinoco Basin. That one was called telepathine at one time because under its influence, people thought they could read minds. In fact, both the Soviets and the Americans sent in expedition forces in the 1960s to get this famous stuff, to extract it, to use it for remote viewing. And of course, bufotenine, one of the types of... Uh, uh, psychotropics from toad skins. Um, you probably remember Bubble, Bubble, Toil and Trouble, The Three Witches of Macbeth, the whole idea of witchery, the idea of using toad skin. Well, there is a clear hallucinogen contained within the toads. And if you ever watch Beavis and Butthead, you're too, too young for Beavis and Butthead? Remember the episode of them sucking on the toads? I think they had the wrong idea of how to get bufotenine. But you see, this kind of class of compounds can produce marked altered states. Now, is there an optimal hallucinogen? Is there an optimal psychotropic? And the answer is no. Because for any of these compounds to work, their basic chemistry must imitate something you already have in your brain. That's right. Some of you are probably making this right now in small amounts. In fact, even something like marijuana would not be effective unless you had the receptors already in your brain. They're called cannabinoids in the case of marijuana. And of course, uh, and you probably have guessed that there are substances you can eat that can stimulate the cannabinoid receptors, dark chocolate, but it would take quite a bit. And you would probably have adverse side effects. I think it's weight gain. <laughs> All, right. <clears throat> All right. So let's take a look at Strassman's work on ayahuasca. He calls it the spiritual molecule. And indeed, this particular molecule, which is dimethyltryptamine, right, dimethyltryptamine, uh, started in the Orinoco Basin. And it's interesting, when people have these experiences, it's all a function of your culture. The local natives say it's the mother, uh, the jungle.